Hello, this is Brenda Blackburn, and I am here just to discuss a little bit about play. And um, I love the idea of just let's play and the importance that play is for children. And, you know, children, the way that they learn and develop and grow is through play. So we want to make sure that we as early educators are really encouraging play in their lives. So here's just some websites that you might want to look at at some other time, but just kind of gives you an idea of some of the different websites that are out there about the importance of play. And Piaget said that knowledge arises neither from objects nor the child, but from interactions between the child and those objects. Um, what a great saying from Piaget. So what is play? So play is the arena in which the body, the mind, and spirit are all in balance. And I love this picture where it just kind of encompasses all of those things there, the body, the mind, and the spirit, as well as balance. Um, such a great picture there about nature's gymnasium. Um, so play is active, it's intrinsically motivated, it's free of external rules upon the play, and then play is dominated by the players and it's meaningful to the players. So all of those that are involved in the play, that's who are really to control it and it's um, what makes it meaningful to them. Play supports the development of the whole child and I just want to make sure that we emphasize that um, you know, the child, the whole child is physical, social, emotional um, approaches to play and learning, as well as spiritual development. So a lot of times we forget, and cognitive development, so a lot of times we forget about the spiritual development of the child as well. But um, that is part of the whole child. Play helps children develop their motor skills uh, through that physical activity. They develop and practice gross and fine motor skills and coordination. And play is primary vehicle for and indicator for of mental growth. Uh, according to Piaget and Vygotsky, play advances the cognitive and creative development in a child. And play also allows children to both practice and demonstrate their competencies and their acquired skills in a relaxed environment. And I love this picture as well because it really does um, kind of display what we're talking about. You know, a lot of times people say, you know, all children do are playing all the time. Is that all you do with them all day, all day long? And, well, play is the work of the child, as Maria Montessori um, has told us in the past, and we need to just adhere to that. That play is the work of the child, and children are working very hard in learning and growing and developing through their play. Play improves social skills, and children learn to negotiate social skills through play, as they explore their social interactions and interpersonal relationships, they're having to figure out um, how to get along with one another, how to share. They're trying to problem solve. Um, so it's a, it really does improve their social skills. Play uh, works off excess physical energy and releases tension. Um, children exercise when they play, which is so important for them. And, you know, we need to remember that we need to play as adults as well so that we can exercise. Um, and according to David Elkind, who is a child developmentalist, children also use play as an outlet for their emotions and stress. And today's world brings about an awful lot of stress in children's lives. So this is, play is just such a great way to release that tension and that stress. And, you know, think about that for us as well. Maybe we need to get out and play a little bit more so we are not as stressful and that we aren't so tense all the time. Um, it really helps us to release some of those endorphins that will help us to negotiate stress in our lives. Play allows children to master anxieties and conflict. Um, according to Freud and Erickson, play is a useful form of human adjustment. Um, because tensions are relieved in play, as we just talked about earlier, and children are able to cope with life's problems in a way that is comfortable and meaningful to them. Many times you'll see children um, kind of play out some of their tensions or their frustrations through dramatic play. Um, and it helps them to cope with the things that are going on in their life, um, as well as even managing conflict among themselves as children. Play is used to explore and test potential potentially dangerous behavior. 
So play allows children to work through emotional conflict, as we mentioned before, in a creative way. But it also allows potentially dangerous behavior to be tested a little bit and explored, but within a safe environment as, you know, as uh, adults are there to help them to negotiate um, some, maybe whether it's a dangerous situation where they're trying to figure out, mm, how much risk do I want to take? Just like in these pictures here, um, you know, we don't want to alleviate all risk from children. Risk is good. It's how they learn cause and effect. It's how they problem solve. And most of the time, children won't take too big a risk. When they know it's too dangerous, they're going to stop. Um, of course, there are those few children that are going to push the limits, and they're going to do a lot of things that are very dangerous. Um, and that's why our, we come into play um, to help them understand when things are a little bit too dangerous. But we don't want to step in too quickly. We want children to be able to problem solve and figure things out on their own. Play is a learning opportunity. Um, children begin to understand their world through play. Play is a means whereby children can safely explore and seek out new information. Again, I think it's just a wonderful learning opportunity for children. It's their work. They're figuring things out. They're learning. They're developing. And we need to let them do that. Play makes learning enjoyable. And I don't know about you, but I like to have a little bit of fun when I'm learning. Um, so according to Berline, um, play is exciting and pleasurable in itself because it satisfies that exploratory drive that each of us have within us. It encourages exploratory behavior by offering children the possibilities of novelty, something they're comfortable with, complexity, uncertainty, and even surprise. Again, it's developing some more of those problem-solving um, traits that we need to encourage in children. So often today, and I don't know uh, how many of you have been encounters with people who really don't know how to problem solve and perhaps they didn't get enough time to play and explore and to navigate their world um, without an adult who is constantly telling them what to do all the time. So children need to explore on their own and to figure things out and just enjoy play. So how can you encourage play? First of all we need to value play and we can do that by providing a comfortable, safe and friendly environment for children and making the play area the children's domain, not the adult's domain, but the children's domain where that is their environment and we want to create the environment for the child, not for the adult. And then spend time playing with them. That encourages it and shows the value of play. So some types and characteristics and examples of cognitive play. First of all, we have functional play and that is where um, there is repetition of movements when new skills are being learned with or without objects, and they're exploring those objects. One of the, some of the examples might be um, grasping and pulling on a mobile for an infant, or preschoolers and kindergartners repeating a pattern on a pegboard. School-age children practicing throwing, catching, and doing acrobats. So there's just some things about functional play. Then there's symbolic play. Um, transforming their world into symbols, they, the use of imagination and role play to transform the self and objects and to satisfy needs. And some examples of that for infants and toddlers might be pretending to drink from a baby bottle. Um, I was even watching my grandson who is a toddler and he was pretending to uh, eat, uh, eat from a, I think it was a corn on the cob actually, he was um, trying to feed a baby. Um, and taking a spoon and kind of pretending the corn on the cob was a bowl and feeding the, feeding the baby. Um, so that's one way of symbolic play. Early symbolic play um, has mental representation that transforms one object for another. Um, and then a later symbolic play is mental representation that transforms self and objects. So for preschoolers and kindergartners, that might be pretending a block is a broken car, pretending to fix it. For school-agers, that's like using secret codes and made-up languages to communicate. I don't know how many of you used to do that, but I used to do that quite a bit as a child. And then constructive play, create something or engage in problem solving. So manipulation of objects or materials to make something. Um, it's combining that functional play uh, repetitive activity with symbolic representation of ideas and that occurs when children regulate their own creation or construction so preschoolers and kindergartners they construct a hospital room for a sick animal maybe 
They're taking it to the doctor's office. Um, School-aged children that might be creating an exhibit of a project just studied or designing virtual games and figures um, with electronic icons. Um, some of you may have done that. Uh, creating your um, emojis or uh, avatars. Oh, so that's kind of fun to do, but that's kind of constructive play. And then there's the games with rules. Um, it's activities with predetermined rules that are goal-oriented and often competitive with one another with one or more individual. Um, and it relies on prearranged rules that guide that acceptable behavior. So for infants and toddlers, it might be playing patty cake with an adult. Or for preschoolers and kindergartners, it might be playing simple singing and circle games, things like that. Um, School-age children, tag, hopscotch, contest, relay races, getting involved in sports. And then there's that pretend or dramatic play that, um, of course, we're all uh, encourage children to, to do at, at each one of these areas um, pretending and dramatic play. So then there's um, characteristics of dramatic and social dramatic play which we want to move into now and there are some different examples here. Um, imitative uh, role play, uh, dramatic, um, the child undertakes a make-believe role and expresses it in imitative action and or verbalization. Then make-believe with regard to objects or fantasy, um, that's kind of a fantasy play where movements or verbal declarations and or materials or toys that are not replicas of the object itself but are substituted for real objects. Um, again, that we kind of talked about that in the last slide. And then there's that verbal make-believe with regard to actions and situations. Um, that's verbal descriptions or declarations are substituted for the actions and situations. So they're being able to verbalize what they want to do as far as make-believe situations. And then there's that persistence in role play. And the child continues within a role or play theme for a period of time, at least maybe 10 minutes long. And then that interaction, at least two players interact within the context of a play episode or a play situation. And then that's verbal communication where there's some verbal interaction related to the play episode. You know, social dramatic play is the vehicle whereby young children use all their developmental attributes. So children combine physical, cognitive, language, and social play in carrying out a play theme or event. An observation of social dramatic play provides snapshots of a child's development. So that's why it's so important as teachers or early educators that we are using observation during children's play. Um, it kind of gives us an idea of their development and how they're doing in their development. Again, you can look on your foundations, your North Carolina foundations, that will give you some good insight into many of these different areas. And then we have levels of social play. Um, so let's talk about this for a minute. We are indebted to the work of Parton and observing and describing how social play develops in preschool children. In her studies of young children, Parton observed that social play increases with age. She described de development of social play into six categories. So first of all, she talked about unoccupied behavior. And that's usually for the zero to two year old child. Um, the child stays pretty much in one place and doesn't seem to be engaged in any kind of purposeful activity. Then there's the solitary play. That's kind of around two to three, eight, two to three years of age. The child prefers to play alone and doesn't interact much with other children. And then the onlooker behavior, the onlooker um, type of play. And that, again, happens around two to three and a half. The child is interested in what other children or, ch or kids are playing, but doesn't seem to join in or ask many questions. And then there's the parallel play. And that can happen between two and three and a half again. And the child imitates other children's play, maybe plays right alongside of them, and may even use some of the same toys, but doesn't engage with other children. Then there's the associative play, which is around three and four years old. The child is starting to be more interested in playing with other children, and even the toys um, he plays with might be what the other ch children are playing with as well. And he's interacting with the other children and making friends. And then there's the cooperative play, which is about four years old up to six plus years. And that's the child's play with other children begins to be a little bit more organized and the goal is to play together and actually accomplish something as a group while they are playing. 
So those are the different types of play. Now, I didn't mention um, back in the other, let's see, when we're talking about the characteristics of dramatic and social, right here, um, social dramatic play, that Sarah Simlansky uh, characterizes those six different criteria of dramatic play that involve that evolve into social dramatic play, and she defines these first uh, first four criteria as dramatic play, and the last two as social dramatic play. Um, so, those are kinds of the things that we can contribute to. Uh, Smolansky, I believe is her name. Sarah, I can't really say that name very well. Um, anyway, she she kind of developed these different characteristics of dramatic and social dramatic play. So when should a teacher intervene in children's play? Well, first of all, when play is actually absent from the children's behavior, we want to be encouraging them and getting them to kind of play with other children or uh, introduce them to particular objects to play with. And when a child... Okay, so we're going to keep on going. Um, when a child finds a task far too difficult, we want to make sure um, we are kind of assisting them a little bit, maybe doing... Um, some scaffolding for them, showing them and helping them. When a child needs assistance to get something done, we want to be there again to scaffold to help them to, to encourage them along. When a child has limited knowledge of the role or object or situation, maybe they've never been introduced to what the other children are playing with at the time. So you might want to help to introduce them a little bit about what's happening um, with the situation that's hap uh, going on. Maybe they've never seen the particular object before. So help explaining it to them and helping them understand what to do with that object. And then of course when children ask you to participate, you want to make sure you join in and play with them. So what are teachers roles in children's play? First of all, we really are observers. We want to be observing, we want to be documenting, we want to be learning about their development and their behavior. We're also collaborators with children. We can help them plan their play and kind of figure out how to do certain things. We can be responders, of course, when they are asking us questions or they are asking us to engage in their play. We can also model, be a model for them, and we can model how to play and how to interact with others. And we can be mediators when necessary between uh, two children or two or more children um, in their play, and we can help them to problem solve. Of course, we and of course, always want to be monitoring children's safety and the importance of that um, to keep all the children safe uh, throughout their play. But then what are the benefits of outdoor nature play? And we believe very strongly in the importance of outdoor nature play. So exploring nature improves children's awareness, reasoning, observational skills, concentration, eyesight, sense of wonder, cognitive abilities, problem solving, and reduces stress. Boy, we should all be out in nature more, shouldn't we? But I love this picture. kind of just shows some of those different things that how it truly um, benefits children. But over here on the side, you can see supports multiple development domains, the holistic development, all of those different areas we've talked about before. Supports creativity and problem solving, enhances the cognitive abilities as well as academic performances. And then it reduces attention deficit disorder symptoms. When children are out in the green, research is very clear that when they are outside amongst the green, then those symptoms of ADD are reduced. Um, so we want to get children out as much as possible. And then when they get when they have to come back inside, they really do um, concentrate better, they can pay attention more, um, and so we really want to be able to get children out in nature. It really helps them, especially those with ADD, as well as all children. And then increases physical activity as well. It improves nutrition. When children are helping um, out growing their own foods, making having a garden and it just truly helps them in their own nutrition and the way they eat, the way they view food. Um, it, it improves eyesight. I don't know how many of you understand this, but myopia, which is nearsightedness, um, when children are outside in nature, they are able to look into the distance and, and use and exercise their eyes more than when they're inside and everything is up close for them. And so it truly helps eyesight if children are outside. It improves social relations with other children. It improves their own self-discipline. And of course, it's going to reduce stress. It sounds like we all need to be outside more in nature. But research shows that children's social, psychological, academic, and physical health is positively impacted when they have daily contact with nature. 
really think that's something we want to encourage, we want to be a part of, and we ourselves, for our own benefits, need to be outdoors in nature. I want us to just quickly watch this wonderful video on nature-based learning and development for teachers. So watch this video with me. In your role as an early childhood educator, you make choices almost every day about learning experiences that affect educational outcomes for children. This video presents information about some of those choices. It shows you how to use the natural world as a learning tool to improve outcomes for the young ones in your room. You will see how to create and maximize opportunities for children to interact with nature. Intentional planning for nature-based learning can make a big difference for children. Research suggests that spending time outside and interacting with outdoor elements can enhance a young child's health and readiness for school. Let's look at how some teachers use nature in their daily routines to enhance children's development in different areas. We'll start with physical development and health. Gardening offers learning opportunities on nutrition and can encourage healthy eating habits. Research shows that children who participate in gardening activities are more likely to eat fruits and vegetables. Natural environments can provide unique and interesting ways to develop motor skills, both fine and gross. Consider what it takes to run up a slope, balance on a log, or pick up a seed. Time spent outdoors and in natural settings can increase levels of physical activity, and this helps to decrease obesity in young children. Next, we'll look at how outdoor play spaces are rich environments for social and emotional development. When children are outdoors, they often engage in a greater variety of interactions and form new friendships. Also, research findings show that engaging with natural elements may help children be less impulsive and get better with directing their attention to a task. The roots. Young children are fascinated and curious about the natural world. Nature-based learning can support children's approaches to learning in many ways. Growing plants and watching seasonal changes helps develop persistence and attentiveness. Nature leads children to seek new information. It inspires art projects, or can even be a medium for creative expression. So Nature-based learning is full of opportunities to practice expressive and receptive language skills. Conversations about nature can contain new vocabulary words for children to easily learn. The concrete definitions or examples are right there in front of them. Fiction and nonfiction books about the natural world help children develop appreciation and knowledge of books, as well as practice alphabet knowledge and phonological awareness. When weather permits, events including literacy night can occur outdoors. So we need to match Henry up to see if he's taller or shorter. You ready to count? Of course, we can't forget about math. Counting, patterns, geometry, and spatial sense. And the scientific method. Hands-on activities with nature encourage children to explore, compare and contrast different elements, and learn new information about plants, animals, weather, and other parts of nature. Oriel, you're right, it does feel like a pumpkin. What's in here? You can engage children in social studies when you place local artifacts, art, or plants indigenous to the area in the outdoor play space. I found a berry right there. Discuss how they relate to history, culture, and the environment. Take children on field trips to local parks, gardens, and farms. They can discover nature in their own community. Who has a memory about what we did at the farm? There. Leah. A tomato. Wow. Look at it. Now, let's review what we've covered about nature-based learning. Research provides a strong case for incorporating nature into learning activities. Giving children ways to experience, move, and interact with the outdoors not only improves health and well-being, it also leads to better academic outcomes. Nature can be used to address the five core domains of the school readiness framework, physical development and health, social and emotional development, approaches to learning, 
language and literacy, and cognition and general knowledge. Nature supports learning in all the domains, and it's fun for children. Whether it is exploring in the woods, making new friends, or learning more words, nature can be the source of better outcomes for children. For helpful resources and more information, please visit the Nature-Based Learning and Development page on your screen. Get started today. The children are waiting to play, explore, and learn outside. <laughs>